Bergkamp makes a run ahead of it. Bergkamp suddenly changed pace through the centre. It's Bergkamp! That's magnificent! Hello and welcome to TGP. Uh, today we have a special surprise. After all of the madness that was the game uh, yesterday, we actually went with one of our sister affiliates, TGP Labs. That's right, the famous Gooner Labs, to figure out what exactly was the phenomenon. And I got to tell you, you are not ready for this, uh, the answer to this, all right? So to help me figure out what was or wasn't a penalty, I have Jared. How are you doing today, Jared? Hey, doing good. And, you know, it wouldn't be the day after an Arsenal game if there wasn't some sort of controversy for everyone to get way too worked up over. But yeah, if there wasn't something for talk show sport to absolutely drill Arsenal on, it wouldn't be a game of football, would it? That's exactly it. It's whether it's us, the officials, the condition, whatever it is, there's always going to be a story that can be argued about from 10 different directions. Yeah, we're like that. Uh, we're we're, uh, we're just the popular girl in school. You know, everybody's talking about it. And long may it continue because it's much better than the banter. Um, and speaking of it not being banter anymore, we're in the big boy leagues. How'd you feel leading up to this game yesterday? You know, I felt pretty confident going into it. We've been, I, I would argue, the strongest team in world football objectively over the last four months. Objectively I mean, is correct. In, in 2024, our record's basically been flawless. We have one draw, and that's at probably the most difficult fixture you can get away to Man City. And in most games, we haven't really been bothered. They they just control games so well, which obviously is the intent of the, of the setup. But it's just been pretty seamless. And I think outside of you know the select few teams that first come to everybody's mind in world football, there's not a lot of teams that really present as big of a challenge as they would have for us. Even even last year, I think there's a certain maturity level and calmness in the squad overall. Now that was certainly tested yesterday with a team like Bayern, but in general, I felt like we handled it pretty well and, and going in I was actually really confident going into the home game there you are the exact opposite of me I you can still hear the nerves in my voice right now I was terrified going into that game <laughs> absolutely terrified why let me tell you why one Bayern Munich have looked like shit all year which means they are inevitably going to regress back to form when they play us and play us only we hadn't had a goal scored on us in something like four hours or five hours or something mm -hmm. crazy of football it was just it, it, it was too much and i honestly going into it i was shitting my pants but again that's part of being on the world stage we asked for days like this we we dreamed of times when arsenal would be relevant again and here we are yeah, and, and it's not that I don't have nerves going into it. I, I had a certain confidence, maybe overconfidence in the squad. I, I did in my prediction. I had it 3-1 Arsenal in the prediction. So I did think this would be the game we finally conceded a goal simply because there's not many attacks in world football like that Bayern front four. That's a, that's a threatening bunch in every way with Sané, Gnabry, Kane, and Musiala. So it's going to be tough to hold those guys out for the full 90 now, we certainly didn't do ourselves any favors in doing that because, uh, you know, both of their goals, you know, credit to them, they converted them, but are based on Arsenal errors that are a little bit atypical of us this season. But, you know, you can't expect to cruise the Champions League every game, especially when you're down to the final eight. It's nothing but world class talent and, and overall just, you know, it's the best teams in the world. And when you've got attackers like that, it's very tough to contain them. And the difference in the league isn't necessarily that we play that much better as much as when you face teams like that, the margin for error is so small and any errors that you do make are going to get exploited to the maximum. And that isn't always the case depending on the league opponent, but it certainly is with someone like Bayern Munich. Speaking of minor margins of error, it would be a minor error if you chose not to like and subscribe to our video today. Make sure to keep the TGP afloat. We've got a lot of fun projects happening. I know a lot of you guys have been checking out Mike's show on Thursday where we do the interviews. We have the WrestleMania show. So lots of fun stuff happening here at TGP. Make sure to keep us relevant. But going back to this game, man. Yeah, you said a name there, Musiala. Uh, I, I, I want to speak about him. I don't think he was incredible in the game, but is he not a solution to a hole that's in our midfield right now? I mean, I just, I, I'm absolutely enamored with the kid. I mean, he'd be a solution in any midfield you picked in world football. He, he's, he's an unbelievable talent. I know there's a lot of talk of, of him moving from there. I, I can't see it. I mean, it seems like it would just be 
insane of Bayern Munich to let him go out the door in any kind of way. But yeah, he's one of the unique talents in world football. And yeah, I think there, you'd be, I'm not sure you could find a lineup that he doesn't walk into. He's, he's that good of a player. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, and also, um, you know, the the one that we're linked with is uh, obviously Kimmich. I don't know if you'd heard about that in the week. I think uh, it was sometime it broke last week that um, Kimmich is talking about not taking up an uh, an extension at Bayern Munich. That he is looking out on the market. Both Arsenal and Manchester City put on alert. How would you feel about him and the team? It cuts a little bit against our recruitment strategy the last couple of years of generally going for younger players. But mm-hmm. I completely understand it. You have to have a balance, you know, for all the young squad that we have. And it is a young squad. We've got the Jorginho, for example, a, a veteran player who's played on the big stage. He's won a Champions League. You have to have a little bit of that to balance it. We, we're lucky and we get a little bit of that in guys in their prime and Jesus and Zinchenko. You know, at their time at City, obviously, they won everything. So you get that experience in a little bit younger package with those guys. But being that the rest of the squad is so young, I understand where Kimmich would fit in. He's a, you know, a good, a good leader, a good experienced player in those games. But also when you look at the way that we now tactically set up, if ever there was a player that's fit to, you know, slot into a fullback position that plays primarily in midfield, mm-hmm. it feels like he would be the perfect guy for that. So for a number of reasons, I think it makes sense. And I, if we can get it done, I wouldn't be surprised and I definitely wouldn't be disappointed. You know, you're hitting on something that I think is actually of relevance to this game, which is interesting. We're always signing all these possible right backs, but it seems like left back might actually be a little bit more of an issue. Going into this game, I, I know I had 10 reasons why I wanted to stomp all over Bayern music. Just just 10 reasons, and I maybe would let them get two back at us. <laughs> but, but that being said, um, when I looked at the team sheet, I wasn't exactly as inspired as most. I don't know how you felt about it. Did you feel, how did you feel when you when you saw that team sheet come out? I wasn't super surprised by it. I mean, mm-hmm. it depends on what direction you want to go. I think the nice thing is now we have a deep squad and we've got a lot of talent, so there's a good argument in a few different positions we could make. Yeah, bro. I'm going to tell you right now, I love me a club with a big fat bench and, and a set yeah. of fat subs, you know, just like a, just, just huge subs just sitting there, just getting all your attention. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because the left back was the one that I think we all talked about because we have three viable options there. Mm-hmm. I wasn't surprised Kivior got the start given that he had been a, just a very solid performer in his time, typically since the turn of the year is when we've really seen really? him a lot. You, you didn't, you weren't surprised at all with the Kivior signing. You don't think that I, I would have had Tommy all day. I, I'm actually kind of curious to know Tommy's fitness level. I know he was mm-hmm. available and in the squad, but it certainly seems like a game he would have been considered when you've seen mm-hmm. at his best, you know, we've seen him really give Mo Salah at Liverpool a difficult time. So you if ever you wanted a 1v1 player in space to try and contend with Sané, who is an absolute handful, I think that makes a lot of sense. And if he, we slotted him in at the start, I would have been perfectly happy because I, I, I get it. Um, that being that it was Kivy or I wasn't super upset just because he's been solid. You know, I think there's a ceiling to what he brings, but there's also a basement. You kind of know what you're getting with him. Mm-hmm. So I, I wasn't too surprised. And he has a lot of familiarity with the, the team more recently just because he's been in it. And I, I think more the surprise at left back for a lot of people, which I'm sure we'll come to, was when it came time to make a substitution because it wasn't working. Because then your two options are completely different directions in terms of, of where you want to go. Yeah, and you know, um, we're talking about left back, but there was something in the middle of the pitch that I was actually pretty surprised about, and that was the inclusion of Jorginho. No, this is not one of my, Aston goes on a rant about how much he can't stand Jorginho and Chelsea and blah, 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 blah. No, 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 it's actually about protecting him. He started the game on Saturday, which I thought he uh, put a huge amount of effort in. I didn't think he was like, uh, you know, I don't think it was his best game in an Arsenal shirt, but it wasn't bad. It was very, very good. And I think that game took a lot of energy. And I'm Mm -hmm. surprised at his age that we would start him two times in three days. That's where I was thinking maybe you could see a substitution. Obviously, Thomas Partey is there. We always wonder about his fitness. Could Emil Smith Rowe, who showed such a good showing for himself against Luton, play this game? I don't know. That's Bayern Munich. Should he have maybe changed it up on Saturday to play one of these players? I, 
I don't know. But for me, when I looked at it, it's not that I have uh, any questions over Jorginho's ability. I think we all know where his shortcomings are when it comes to athleticism. And that's what I'm talking about is I, I just – for a team that is as counterattacky as Bayern Munich, I thought we would have had a little more pace in the middle. But that's just me. I can certainly see the argument for it. The the reason, and, and to go back to what you said, I am surprised if we're planning on starting him yesterday that he played as long as he did on the weekend. Um, I think there's a chance there to maybe give him a little bit more rest. But that's you know kind of nitpicking. We're talking about you know ten fifteen minutes really. Yeah. Um, I, I think it came down to Smith Rowe as well as he performed hasn't been in the team as much. And there is a lack of experience factor in in a game when you're, I know it's at home, but you're hosting Bayern Munich in a Champions League quarterfinal. That's a big stage. And I think Jorginho is the safer option there. And looking at our game plan of going in and kind of doing what we do of planning to control the game, hold them back in their own end. I think Jorginho makes sense there over Smith Rowe. Now we had more difficulty in, in doing that than I think maybe we anticipated, but I understand the thought process to, to leave him in over someone like Smith Rowe. Thomas Party, I put in the Tomiyasu category. I'm not sure where the fitness level is. is. Is he good to go 30 minutes? Is he good to go an hour? Is he good for 90? I, I think if he was to the point he's good for 90, as good as Jorginho's been, Thomas Party's a different level of player right now. He, he's a world class player in that position, and I think he does, you know, deserves as a relative term. I know when you haven't played all season, some people would say he doesn't deserve that spot. But in terms of talent, he's definitely the top of the three or four that we could put in that spot. So. I if he was available, he would probably be my go-to, and if we may see that in in Munich if he is ready to go. But if he, you know, is is still coming back and they don't think he's got the full ninety in him, I completely am on board with sixty or seventy for Jorginho and then party filling whatever the remaining gap is. Yeah, yeah, I. Mm. I, I would go the other way with Parde being the main man, but I, I, I hear exactly where you're coming from as far as his fitness is concerned. I do think that we do miss. There's just something about it when uh, we played Luton, and I know that it's just Luton. I know. But it's something about there's a verticality to Thomas Partey's passing. Mm -hmm. When he is on the pitch, we are so much more vertically quick. And it's not that Jorginho doesn't have the ability to pass vertically. He very much does, but... Jorginho more has that quarterback style pass where he's going to send the ball over over the defense, right, place it on, you know, put it on a dime in front of you if you're making runs against the defenders. But as far, far as like verticality, ball to feet, working in tight spaces, that's more Thomas Partey's game. And that's what I thought we needed. And I actually still think that we might need going into the Allianz Arena now. The game started off. I I would say we were we were very much in it. We were very much on top. It was a lot of familiar patterns started to arise. Um, I think I'm going to come into my one big problem with the first half when we when we get to halftime. But I think overall we were we were very very good in that opening few minutes, all the way leading up to Saka's goal. In fact, right before Saka's goal, Martinelli had a pop at goal, which I think he should have done a little bit better with, at least put it on target. But the goal comes from in the most Arsenal way that you can imagine. Uh, Saka wins the ball high up the pitch. Odegaard um, um, tries to get past the guy. Odegaard uh, ends up you know, almost losing it, but manages to hold on to it because Odegaard and Ben White are right there pressing along with them. Kai Havertz is there with them too. I think Kai Havertz is the one that actually picks up the ball after Saka loses it, passes to Odegaard. Odegaard. There's this space between the center back and the fullback, which is just like the Saka and Odegaard zone, mm -hmm. where it's like if there's a ball going into there, just pass the ball into there. Those two will figure out how to get onto it. And when Saka gets onto it, Boy, yeah. I mean, in the, boy, in the last I, Premier League game, we saw him miss one that's a similar opportunity. And, and when it happened, yeah. you, you think to yourself, I mean, he never misses those. So when it came to him this game, I was pretty sure he was going to slot at home. But it, it's that it's that short like that's that's short back lift, small, uh, like very low height, quickly whipped around a couple mm -hmm. of finishes. It's just so perfect and so beautiful. It's world class. It's, it's, it's exactly the finish that you would expect of Mohamed Salah or a, a, um, a, a Lionel Messi, or, or I'm not trying to put him on Messi's level or anything like sure. that. But you understand what I'm saying, that that left footed strike from the right, just short curled perfect into the side netting. I don't know. I really enjoyed that goal. I thought it was a great goal. It was a 
quintessential Bukayo Saka goal for me. We see it all the time, and he just slots it home perfectly. And one of the things you said leading up that I thought was eminently true to start the game, that game kicked off and started the way most Arsenal games have over the last mm. couple of months. They, they looked to be in control. We had them push back in their, in their end. And one area that I think that they shored up a little bit as the game moved forward where they were really missing was Martin Odegaard for the first 15 minutes. It felt like every time he got the ball and turned, he was in space. And yeah. it was one thing that you would think scouting Arsenal that you would want to avoid is giving him time free on the ball to look around and make decisions and try and find a pass. So I thought the the setup was a little bit surprising from them to allow him to do that. Uh, I didn't necessarily think they were going to man mark him the entire game, but I, I certainly don't think the game plan would be to give him that sort of space every time he comes onto the ball. But they, mm-hmm. they did, and we take advantage, and, and we get the early goal. And at that point, the confidence level went through the roof because the game started the way we'd been seeing Arsenal play. We'd get the early goal, we'd take the lead. And I think we all thought, you know, we can really apply the pressure and turn this into a, a pretty one sided tie with a good result. Um, ben White misses a, a pretty good opportunity which changes the game dramatically because not long after that, we are a little confused at the back. We make a mistake on a play that I I don't hate on him much because he's so amazing, but I think Declan Rice made a little bit of an error in judgment and it gives them a goal. And now it's whether you feel like you've dominated or not, it's one, one and the momentum's on their side. So that quick succession of white, not converting and then us giving up a goal right away really changes things so dramatically. It's hard to understate how much that changed the game state from there forward. Listen, I'm not going to come at a player, a center back playing as right back who found himself in a striker position. You know, I'm not going to sit here and try to complain too much, but Ben white, Benny Blanco, you've done so much so right this year. How you managed to just kick that ball directly into Nor, like didn't, didn't even try to go either side, just said, hey, man, can you catch this ball? Yeah, it's, it was, it's, it's disappointing, disappointing to say the least. Disappointing for sure, given how open he was in space right there, which obviously was unexpected and it kind of came to him. I don't think he was prepared to have that sort of a look, mm-hmm. but I, I don't kill him for yesterday's game he did miss the big opportunity there that shifted it but equally we should credit him in the second half i believe it was second half when sane had a free run and he's charging full speed trying to catch up to the play and ends up making the tackle that recovers the ball that if he doesn't do that you know they may score there and now it's a completely different situation headed back to munich yeah, I don't know if that was like Ben White or a like a white BMW just careening <laughs> down the field. I like I did not know he had that kind of pace in him. It was incredible. You you were talking about let's 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 go ahead and let's talk about um their first goal, right? Um the 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 whole thing happens. I believe it was a quick counterattack them trying to kick the ball over the pitch, um, over over our midfield because they weren't having any luck going through it. And normally, like you see 99 times out of hundred, matter of fact, this is Gabrielle and Saliba. So I'll say 999 times out of a thousand, they just clean that ball up and kick it away. I'm not quite sure what happened. Raya comes out charging through the middle, trying to do the sweeper keeper thing. Gets a little excited, but I still don't quite understand what the issue is here. It, him and Gabrielle had plenty of time to communicate. Um, Gabrielle takes the ball, realizes passing um, to his keeper who is backpedaling towards the goal may not be the best idea. So he passes it to Kiwi or who makes a little bit of a meal of it. He was, on uh, he was on his heels, even though I'm not really going to go at Ki- Kiwi or too much. Cause I think that pass was under hit and unexpected. Uh, there was a swivel of the hits that Gabrielle did right before he took it. That I think threw everybody off. Um, Declan Rice. Declan Rice, Declan Rice in peace, Declan, the king of London, I would even uh, suffice it to say, after coming from West London and coming to North London and doing his thing, has not put a foot wrong all year. And that was bad. It it was in, you know, like, like you said, he's been so good. It's hard to criticize him because we probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for everything he contributes and will continue to contribute. But if you dissect that exact play, when Kivior misses the ball, there's a gap. There's a huge gap between Saliba mm-hmm. and Gabrielle that he's filling. And you see him, and it's not a huge difference, but he takes three or four steps out forward, and it just opens up and uh, opens up enough space to play the ball behind him. And from there, Bayern 
does what they do. They've got world-class attackers and they execute it perfectly and Gnabry finishes it. Well, and, and this is where, and this is where um, I think happens. If I'm going to step into the, you know, the mind space of Declan Rice, which is very hard because like my mere mortal brain can't, you know, keep all of that going at once. But I think what he was trying to do is if you see they win the ball and I think he sees Goretzka, the, the pass on to Goretzka, and he's trying to step into the path mm-hmm. of the pass. But instead of taking it immediately, they just delay it, and it allows Goretzka to run off the back of him, which allows an even better pass because now he's cut out of the you know the picture, and then you know the rest is history. And Gnabry comes back to his old Arsenal home, and it's ex- as if it was written in the stars. Yeah, and it, and it comes down to execution. When when we make the error. Mm. They didn't falter in capitalizing on it. Like you said, they they timed it perfectly, the pass in. The ball on Gnabry was perfectly placed, and then he executes a, a really good finish because Ben White was closing mm. him down or attempting to, and Gnabry recognizes it and scores the goal. I, and I know he's gotten a lot of hate for celebrating quarterfinal of the Champions League. I love Serge Gnabry. I don't have a problem with the way he celebrated the goal. It's a It's a massive goal to get, especially when you're losing at that time. So I think the hate on him is a little bit, overdone but yeah brilliant all around from them in that sequence and and not so much from the arsenal man's had to play next to harry kane watch all of his goals go to him and meanwhile Bayern maybe not lifting a trophy for the first time in their like history in the last you know couple he's allowed to celebrate he's allowed to be happy he's allowed he's allowed to feel something i'm not i'm not mad at it in fact i would still have gnabry back he's a still he's a little old you know, it's it's getting on to the age thing for him as far as like, why wouldn't you just recruit somebody younger that you could get about probably the same talent level? But I don't know. I'd, I'd like to have him around the club. I have always had a soft spot for him. I always was bewildered. We we remember how he left. We loaned him out to Stoke. Do you remember that? Well, <laughs> as if Tony Pulis, and this wasn't like, you know, remember Stoke right before they left the Premier League, they were trying to do the Stoke Alona thing, right? When they were actually trying to play. But no, no, this was prime Tony Pulis that we sent, gave Gnabry to. And I, I just never understood why we did that. And he went on to be what he became. Yeah, the end of his tenure here was definitely weird. But if you ever yeah. talk about players that you would love to see back, he's one of the top on my list. I don't think it'll ever happen. Bayern's probably not going to be in a hurry to let him go. The financials, I'm not sure he fits into our current wage structure with the amount he gets paid. Mm. But when you talk about a guy who fits into a system and, and would fill a spot we need, when you watch that game yesterday, when Alfonso Davies got that early yellow card, it was going to put them under pressure because we they know we're going to look to Saka and we're going to be running at him a lot. Serge Gnabry, ran back, covered Alfonso Davies beautifully for, for the entire time he was in the game. He ran his tail off for the duration. And that's the, when you look at the way we play, that's the type of player that Arteta loves is somebody who's not just obviously technically gifted, but has the engine and is willing to take on whatever responsibility is going to fall on them. You know, if Davies doesn't get that early yellow, the game's d- dramatically different for Gnabry. But because he did, he spent half of his time running back covering Saka um, on their own end. And and he should get kudos for that because I thought he played a brilliant game overall. And just the overall effort level from him was, was off the charts. Yeah, I was, I, you know, I was really hoping now, obviously we won't see Davies in the next game because of the yellow card accumulation, but I was really hoping that, it, you know, a little more was going to happen between them. And, you know, again, hats off to him for managing to keep his cool. What mm-hmm. I will say, um, about Gnabry and his hard work um, working back is he had to, he's the one that's actually keeping a lid on Ben White most of the game. And it was actually very impressive to see because if you remember, uh, Ben White was inverting in the first half. So he was always up the pitch and Gnabry actually dealt with them pretty well. Now their second goal talking about fullbacks, not dealing with something well. Okay. And this is where the Ki- Kiwi or and Sané thing comes in. And this is where I'm like, I do have to slate you for that because if you're going to, if Sané is going to go past you like that, just foul him. I'm sorry. I know that that might seem wrong. It might seem, you know, like a cheating mentality, but I don't know. Everybody, everybody at this level of football understands if you've lost your man, just take the yellow card 
get subbed out, like you got subbed out anyway at, at halftime, get subbed out, the team moves on, and we're still 1-1 in this game. I don't know how you felt about it. A hundred percent. That's a spot for a tactical foul. And I think when you talk about guys being inexperienced in big games, that's one where Kivior is obviously inexperienced, and that was the proper play in that case. And I know some people don't like tactical fouling, and I get that, and I don't have a problem with people saying that. But you see mm-hmm. the difference. When Thomas Party came on, I think he picked up a yellow within his first five minutes because he saw Bayern was about to break and was going to have an advantageous position. And he immediately just chops the man down immediately right in front of the ref makes no effort on the ball, chops him down, knowing exactly what he's doing, but, but that's what you get out of a mature experienced player. So, so there is a difference obviously between the two players, but in general, but the experience level, Thomas party understands game time and score. If you want to call it that and understands that they're about to put us in a dangerous spot, chops the man down instantly. Kivior doesn't do that. And like we talked about earlier, it's not a team that's going to forgive many errors. And they took advantage once again, and they put themselves in a good spot. Saliba definitely fouls the man in the box, and it was a it was a deserved penalty. So, you know, again, yeah, we're trying to do it to ourselves, but it was the right decision. A little bit, a little bit, and I'm not doing this to go I told you so, because who am I to Arteta? Mikel Arteta, I am done doubting you. You know what you're doing. But I will say a little bit of what I was saying earlier. If you see... Kiwi, um, Sane skins Kiwi or, and then it's Jorginho who can't quite get back. It's like he has, he's literally like one step too slow to be able to get to that ball. And it's just one of those situations where I'm like, if that was Thomas Partey, I think that they don't score there. I, I think that Partey gets to that ball. Jorginho actually slides and just misses the ball. And Sane managed to ride, manages to ride that challenge. I just, to me, and it's not a slight on Jorginho, and it, he's already not athletically gifted, but maybe he gets there if this was Saturday. Maybe if he was rested on Saturday, he gets there. And that's just my one criticism. We have to remember, and this is something that I think that so many people, because it's the Champions League, we're excited, we're happy, we're, we haven't seen Arsenal in it for so long, try to forget about the context or or... or or the rival fans will make you forget the context of Arteta's 42 and this is his first Champions League run. He's going to have to learn on the job a little. He's not going to be perfect the first time. In fact, the fact that he got so far already is actually a monumental achievement for his career. And and I think those small decisions, like I said, like having Jorginho play midweek and then having Jorginho play this game, um, or or just having starting Kiwi or a guy that's uh, maybe when you're looking at Sane, I don't know why you would think that he would lock up Sane. Maybe those decisions or even the overall, it really felt like a game that we went into the mind, we need to win two or three now. It really felt like that's what we were pushing for, that we felt that we were coming into that game to win that game by a goal or two and then go back to the Allianz and do our thing and and shore it up. And maybe that wasn't. Maybe we didn't respect Byron enough in that in, in that respect. I don't know what you think of it. Yeah, I could see that. And the thing is, we were very close to being up two 0 early, as we talked about Ben White's chance earlier. So it, it's just the small margins, and and momentum is a powerful mm-hmm. thing in sport. And when you give a team as talented as Byron any momentum at all, it, it's really tough to take that back from them because they're a group of grizzled veteran world class players. And when they get on a roll, they're they're going to be tough to stop, even when they're not, you know, at their best. Which people would, I think, all agree they're not this season overall. But for ninety minutes, when they turn it on, that's a when you look at that roster, top to bottom, that's a tough squad to handle. Yeah, not uh, not at their best. Sane just took Kiwior's <laughs> lunch money for fucking fun. Okay, like you have to remember these are really like this isn't we're not going down to with all due respect the Grove or or to the the Stadium of Light or something and you know playing those types of men where you know William Saliba and Gabrielle can basically you know take you know pull out their lawn chairs and, and play a game. This is Bayern Munich. OK, these this is a team that uses the rest of the Bundesliga as it's like as it's little uh, um, it's training ground. It's it's where it grows its players. All of the resources of Germany are poured into this team. Have some respect. Remember whose house you are coming in. We have to you know, we have to be that way. And there's something I want to show you because I now want to get into what my biggest issue was during that first half. And I was screaming it at the bar the entire time. Look at this pass map. 
right? The on the left hat uh, left hand side, you can see our first half. On the right hand side, you can see our second half. The entire first half, I was screaming, "Do not kick the ball down the left side of the field. There is something wrong. We are not able to pass or progress the ball up the field." I don't know if that was a combination of Jorginho's tired legs, QER not having the passing range, or maybe it's Martinelli not being up to stuff, but there was something wrong with the left side of the pitch yesterday. And I think we desperately need to figure out what exactly it was. I think we did a lot to change it and it got a lot better with the subs coming on, but I don't know if I ever want to see those three on the same side of the pitch again. Yeah, it it definitely was the weaker of the two sides. There's no question about that. Saka was the danger man, as he always is. Odegaard, danger man, as he always is. And I think there's just a little bit of a disconnect on that side. When you look at Odegaard, Saka with White behind, those three guys have played as many games together as anybody this season. They're all readily available. They play a ton of minutes, probably more than they should in a lot of cases. And the other side, the amount of time those guys have played together is significantly less. And you take the fact that Ben White's a superior player to Kivior. I think everyone would agree to that. Jorginho and Odegaard, different players. Obviously, Odegaard's more in his prime. It's just a different in quality on both sides. So you, you take that difference in quality of player along with the experience of playing together more. And, and I think it kind of shows itself in, in bigger, tougher games because, it, like you said, there, were, there was no doubt the threat down the left was just not there for us in the way it is in, in some games we've seen in the past. Now, we made up for that, and we were threatening on the right side, which is good, but I, I think we're going to see some definite adjustments as we head into Munich. Probably not the ones we were expecting to make. You know, If we leave the Emirates with a 2-0 a buffer, we're going to go there and play probably more like we did against Man City, very protective, defend well like we do, and hold them out. Now you've got to go there with the idea you've got to score some goals because the odds of keeping a clean sheet against them on their ground is not real high when, when you look at how lethal they can be in attack. So we've got to go there, I think, with the mind that we're going to score two goals. I think, you know, if we had our Drellers 2-1 win is what you're looking for headed into Munich. Yeah, they're probably going to find a goal somewhere. So you've got to go and score a couple. And, and we're perfectly capable of doing that because their defense is good, not great, is how I would classify it. Similarly to the way I say about Manchester City, they're certainly not bad, but they're not a world-class defensive front. Um, any team with Eric Dyer starting at center half <laughs> is going to be gettable. I mean, they, they just are. <laughs> And, did you see yep. time out, time out, did you see that whole game? It was so obvious. I could have I could have written Arteta's game plan for you because he made it so obvious. Whenever Eric Dyer gets the ball, run directly at him. Yeah. He will shit his <laughs> pants. Yeah, when somebody looks uncomfortable, that's that's what you do. You put pressure on them. And and our press up front, they're very good at putting pressure on those guys. So the combination of that and a couple of set piece opportunities specifically on corners. We put it into a dangerous space and mm. a couple of times, you know, you catch the right deflection and you can score. So as good as we are on set pieces and as shaky as they looked at times, I think that's definitely an area of opportunity as we head to their place that we could maybe bag a goal or, you know, knowing Arsenal, maybe bag two off of set pieces and, and come away with the win. So you're talking about areas of opportunity. Let's talk about, is this an area of opportunity or is this a weakness that's able to be exploited? Zinchenko. So, yeah, I mean, it, I guess it depends on your point of view, and there's probably mm -hmm. people that would take both sides of this. When the decision's made to take Kivior off, you've got Tomiyasu or Zinchenko, two very different players. And I think, you know, the conversation you're having internally if you're Mikel Arteta is, do we want to try and gain back some control by solidifying defensively with Tomiyasu and try and limit Sané? Or do you want to solidify by trying to put Zinchenko and his midfield possession skills in the game and keep more of the ball. Um, he went with the latter. I think there's a fair argument for both. But I will say, even looking back in hindsight, I don't think it was the wrong decision. I, I think the game changed dramatically for the better once Zinchenko came on. Whether or not it's impacted more positively by Tomoyasu, I think, is the argument. But I don't think it was a bad choice because I thought we looked better with Zinchenko than when we had Kivior in the game, at least. Yeah, I definitely agree here. There were times when I, I, I understand, and I think that Zinchenko is the type of player where, unfortunately, 
I don't know where he is with the the wider fan base. There's almost seems to be an anxiety whenever he's on the ball, and I can't imagine that that goes over well. Matter of fact, we can all hear it on the TV. When Zinchenko has the ball, our our fans get a little quieter. There's a little bit of nervousness around the pitch, even though I thought almost immediately he created about two or three chances for us. Mm -hmm. I saw the improvement, but I also know that going the other way, I was terrified every time Sané had the ball. Anytime any of them have the ball on that side of the pitch, I'm like, fuck, 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 fuck. What do we do? And, and you know, to to his credit, though, Zinchenko, you know, rode through that. I want, I want to ask you some, about something. Speaking about a little bit of controversy in the second half, what did you make of that Gabriel handball thing? You know, uh, the the, the uh, I think the whistle got blown and, and Gabriel went and Raya kicked the ball to him as a goal kick, but Gabriel thought he was kicking it to place. I don't know. Yeah, they were doing their usual routine. And like probably 99% of people, I didn't even notice it in real time. Um, I'm just so used to seeing him go through that same routine. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't hear the whistle. So I, I, I it was a non-factor in my thoughts during the game. Afterwards, when it came out and you see the replay, it, you can hear a whistle blow. So I understand where it's likely should have been a pen. I've seen some other people say the ref didn't see it. He blew the whistle twice. So maybe there was some controversy there. It's one of those things. Do you want the game to be officiated in the way that makes sense for people? And, you know, do you want to give a pen in that area? Or is it we're going to officiate the game by the letter of the law? And what the letter of the law says is what we're going to go with. If, you know, the question is, should that have been a penalty? I have to say yes, because it's very clear in the rules. He can't handle the ball there and he does it. So did we get away with one? A little bit. Do I understand the referee's decision to not, given the situation of Arsenal, Bayern, Bayern Munich, and the Champions League? As a fan, I do. And, you know, that's part of the problem. And I know this is not the only time we're going to talk about officiating decisions here on the podcast. You got a big one coming. <laughs> but, you know, they're human too, and they understand situations. And there's no way for it to not impact the way they officiate the game. You know, we always talk about you know what's a foul what's not a foul and they say well if that happened in the fifth minute it's a foul if it happens in the 95th minute probably not so we all kind of know and in some cases accept the game is going to be officiated differently depending on when something happens is that right again by the letter of the law probably not does it make the game better in, in some cases it probably does so did arsenal get away with one i think the answer is yes do I understand the official's decision to, to not give that penalty for that in that game? Sure, as a fan, I definitely do. Now, if I was a Bayern Munich fan, I'd probably say the opposite, but, but I'm not. So here we are. Listen, I just think that um, that this it's interesting. It's interesting, right? I think that Gabrielle's, Gabrielle's causing a lot of BBC. You know, I, I know a lot of people like BBC, but I'm not personally a fan of BBC. That's, of course, bitch babies crying. <laughs> Um, and Thomas Tuchel, this is for you <laughs> because you have to be a can. I'm sorry, the type of person that thinks that that needs to be a penalty is just like the type of person you don't want to have a party with. You know, you, you, you don't you don't invite them out to social gatherings. You're like, what is actually wrong with you that you think that this should be a penalty? Because if Arsenal were doing something where we were getting some sort of advantage, we were trying to win one over, but are, are you kidding me? You want a penalty for this? You want to win that way? I wouldn't want to win that way, honestly. And, and this is, and a lot of people say a lot of things. And, you know, if the ref gave this as a penalty, obviously I would take it. But at the same time, I wouldn't feel good about it. I'd honestly feel disgusting. I'd be like, I can't believe that this is something that they would do. I wish they would have just not given. I would, after scoring the penalty, wish that we had never scored, like wish that it never happened. So I don't know. I think you have to be a real, real, like you have to really hate the sport or you have to be really obsessed in your own world to uh, want that to be a penalty. Um, but that did signal the change, right? Because the whole reason that happened was because Gabriel and Trussard were coming on the pitch. That's where the confusion with the whistles came from in the first place. So Gabriel and Trussard came onto the pitch and they changed the game. I think that, um, listen, I have so many good things to say about Kai Havertz. So when he doesn't have a great game, I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to slate him for it. I think if there's any attention that we need to pay attention to in the attacking front, it's Martinelli. Martinelli's numbers haven't been great all season, and this is another not great performance coming from him. But 
but but I don't even want to focus on that. I just want to talk about Leandro Trussard and Gabriel Jesus, who came on and absolutely shown for Arsenal. And when you have when you have uh, uh, players like that, when you have a bench full of fat fat subs. You can do things like that, and you can change the game, and I think they really did. I mean, it was it, it was scrappy again, but it was Trussard's just magical touch to pass it on to to uh, Gabriel Jesus, whose close control is unmatched in this mm-hmm. team. I still think that, like, you know, he may not be able to finish, but boy, can he tiptoe and dance like no other on um on on the team really. And then to to just wallop it in. There's Trussard knowing what Gabriel's going to do. There's kind of a, a telepathy between them, if you will. And then the second, the, the goal goes in. And at that point, I'm actually disappointed because I thought we were going to score a third. Yeah, again, it's a massive momentum swing in the game. And it just felt like everything was going to turn our direction. And those two had such a massive impact. I think we'll see one of them start in Munich. I don't think we're going to see both start. Um is because you want to have somebody who can come in and make an instant impact off the bench. Well, you heard the thing about Jesus, right? What's that? That basically it's been, now it's official. I had said this several, several podcasts ago um, where I'm like, it looks like Jesus is slower now. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that he actually does have a knee problem. He will probably be going down for surgery yet again. And he's, they've been so basically nursing it after the game. He said he can't remember a game. He hasn't played through pain. Um, and I think that's been really obvious in his play since last year, since he came back, he just doesn't have that speed. Now he has the trickery, he can change direction, but if you're just talking about like the pace that he had at the beginning of last season, it's, it's been gone for some time now. That's interesting. He did look, I thought the last couple of games, he looked slower than usual, but when you see him start to get into his bag of tricks and juggling the ball a little bit, it feels like he's back to his old self a little bit. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, the the close control and the way he maneuvers and affects the defense that leads up to the goal is is what you expect from him. That's the best of Jesus. He just knows how to move the ball to get the defenders where he wants them. And Trussard, I mean, if ever we've had a player that knows how to put the ball in the back of the net when he gets his opportunity, it's him. He feels like his conversion rate is one of the best on the team, if not the best. It, it's just every time he gets an opportunity, he finishes it. And... I've heard a lot of calls for him to start the next game mm-hmm. over Martinelli, which is understandable given the performances they put out. I'm always a little skeptical to do that only because there are some players that can be very talented. And if they're on the pitch for the full 90, you see the best of them. There's not as many players that are very talented that can come in and show you that in 20 minutes when it's on a limited a limited basis and there's equally good players that fall into both not everyone has whatever it is that lets you bet into a game immediately 70 minutes in and and make an impact we've seen it time and time again some players have it and some don't and that's not a slight to anyone but i think when you have one of those players you want to utilize that talent and i would feel more comfortable next game if we need a goal at the 70th minute bringing on trossard over almost anybody in the squad so i almost hold on to him for that He's the best finisher at the club, and I don't think that that's even an argument anymore. I think that Trussard has the best finish at the club. I I think that he does sometimes struggle when he's in for an entire 90 minutes. I think he fades. I think he's a guy that comes in and out of games, and maybe that's why he's better suited for a sub role, not because he's lacking any talent or deadliness or importance to the squad, but specifically because he... he it's like if you can get him focused, if you can get one of those up periods with Trussard, he really becomes one of those untouchable players. And I, I absolutely adore the guy. And the same goes with Jesus. When Jesus is in his mood, he's quite frankly unplayable. And and I think we saw that a little bit yesterday. Um, before we go into the, um, the, the the final controversy, I do. There is one more thing. I, we, we didn't talk about the Harry uh, Kane penalty because who cares? Um, I'm tired of that story. I've heard it my entire Arsenal life, blah, 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 whatever. More interestingly, another thing that I've heard my entire life is Harry Kane getting away with elbows. Um, was that a red card for you? Do you think that's harsh to say that it's a red card? Because I think it was definitely a red card. I, I certainly don't think it's harsh to say it's a red card. I, I think if the official on field ruled it a red, there's zero chance it gets overturned and, and taken back down to a yellow. I think, you know, the term orange card gets thrown around a lot. And this is the perfect example. 
the 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 look back before i think is what gets everybody he locates where he is in space so does he say i'm going to elbow him in the face in his head maybe does he know exactly where he is when he throws that arm back a hundred percent he does we just saw him look and check where he was so it's one of those that however it was called it was probably going to stay and in big games like that i think things tend to fall in harry kane's favor in terms of officiating so it, it, was, it was what i expected i think i tweeted at the time kane with an elbow to gabrielle's face got a yellow will stay a yellow I, I, at no point did i think it was going to get up to a red card i i'm, I'm going to tell you something and and you know I, I honestly think the yellow card might have gone the wrong way. I think they should have given it to Gabrielle. I think that he initiated contact with his face. Um, I don't know how you could say anything else because clearly his head is in an unnatural position. Um, I don't know if you've ever moved with your body before, but personally, I keep my head unattached several feet away from my body. Um when I when I do things. And obviously I'm being tongue in cheek because I am going to bring up this stupid, stupid, stupid call. Now, the reason I bring up this stupid call, let me let me say a couple of things before we get into this. Arsenal should have played better on the day. Arsenal were naive. Arsenal made some rookie mistakes. And and had we been more clinical and had we had a better performance, um, I don't think that we would even be thinking about this call, this challenge, this issue. The only reason why this is so pivotal is because the margins were so thin, because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. So let me say that first, before people come in here and try to say anything about, we were not good enough on the day. And I am actually not happy. This is the first time you've seen me with an unhappy with our performance, performance this year. I do not think that we played well enough. Even even in the city game, when we were when we weren't going at them and we weren't scoring, we weren't playing our normal selves. At least there was a reason for that. We were counteracting what they were doing. Bayern were counteracting what they were doing on the pitch. They were counteracting themselves. Okay, I'm not sitting here trying to disrespect Bayern. I just do not think that that was anything that they did um, yesterday should have gotten them goals. And it was stupid of us to let that go through. That being said, this is a fucking pin mate. <laughs> this is a fucking pen. So, I don't know if this isn't a penalty. What the fuck is a penalty anymore? So let me let me bring it up for you. All right. If I do this slowly enough, we won't get um copyright strike. I've learned this from Terry Fluers. All right. So anybody copy mad at us for copyright, go go at him. All right. <laughs> um you just have to you just have to show frames. So so this is the first angle. This is the angle that we saw on TV, right? Saka's onto the ball. And cl- right there, I don't know. I don't know how you don't see that. Like clearly to me, Nor is sticking his foot out. I, I don't know how you see that. He's sticking his foot out. Saka is going over. We're going to get a couple of more angles to see it closely. But from this angle, I don't think that there's really any much more you need to see here. You know, here comes Saka. And Neuer takes a step towards him. You can clearly mm-hmm. see a step and Saka goes over, right? I don't see I don't see how you can see that any differently. Now, of course, there are other angles of this. Mm-hmm. You can see this angle. To me, this angle is even more damning. Right? But here's the angle that people are are in their jimmies about, right? This is the angle that people and I still don't see it. Tell me. We both live in the social media space. There has been every the interesting part about this is everyone says their idea or their thought on it is 100% correct. And I can't understand how anyone can see anything different, which is what makes it interesting. And it's been, I've seen a big, I've seen Ian Wright say he thought it was not a penalty. I've seen Rio Ferdinand say it was a penalty. So take the Arsenal allegiance out of it, which is difficult for us because obviously we're Arsenal fans, but I've seen from a multitude of people, whether it be officials, players, ex players, whatever it is, go both directions on it. So that tells you, it's probably at least controversial or arguable. Um, again, if it's called a penalty on the pitch, there is no chance it gets overturned. Absolutely zero because Neuer does stick the leg in and people say Saka initiated and looked for the contact. That's true. He did look for the contact and he found it because Neuer stuck his leg in. That's the way I view it. I, I think they put themselves in a dangerous spot and, you know, got the bad end of it or should have got the bad end of it. Now, I, if the argument comes down to does Saka try and get the contact because his legs in there, 
yeah, I think so. But that's what attackers do. And then here, oh, I see somebody, I think Sasky Gunner just put it in the chat. I was going to bring this up next. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, Harry Kane afterwards basically said the same. He said, if that was my team, I would be upset that it's not a penalty. And I think that's where kind of everyone could agree we would fall. If it happens to the team you support, you would think it's a penalty every time. Um, so can I say something real quick? Because because I see uh, BX Schooner came in here, um, and and I I want to I want to I want everybody to kind of understand something that I did here that I think that is the issue of the whole thing. What a lot of people don't realize is this: what I what we just showed you that was it going at a quarter speed. Right. I think that when you look at it in slow motion, you think, oh, why doesn't Sokka move here? It's because this is happening in within a split second. I don't think that it is physically possible for Sokka to move like people are saying, why don't you just move around him? Well, he is. He's trying to go around him and Neuer makes a movement that Sokka can't compensate for because he's in the air trying to go around him. One more time. Look, that's at regular speed. Do you see how quick that is? What time does Sokka have to go around him? You, 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 what you're what you're wanting Sokka to do is to do a skill, maybe to go around him, flick him, do something. But I I don't think that he is under any obligation to do that. That's just me. I know it, it, I'll probably stick on this thing the whole day, and I don't want to, you know, ruin the end of the the podcast. But that's just my my take on the whole thing. Yeah, and and the point I raise, and this has been going on back and forth on Twitter with people for the last twenty four hours is and it comes back to the referee and and this is where i'll say may, 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 one more, one more. I, got, I got to get this one he goes down too easy look at this again i'm going to slow this down for you so you can see it one more time he tries to stay up he tries to stay up he plants his first foot back down look this is him after the contact he's trying to stay up this is him trying to plant his foot down and then falls over one more time, one more time for everybody in the back. He is not trying to go down. Boom. Plants his foot. I, I, I just don't get it. I don't know. That's me. I, I I need to stop. I need to stop. I'll obsess over this, Jared. And you know what happens when I obsess over it. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, and the point I raised is, if that challenge or a similar challenge happens outside the box in the 20th minute, it's going to be called a foul every time. So what this really comes down to is, the referee's judgment of, do I want to make that call in that place? And this referee showed us early in the game with the Gabrielle incident, because he said he saw it in real time and, and made the decision to not call it based on the situation in the game and not wanting it to be decided by that. I think that a similar thing plays in here. He didn't want to point to the penalty spot mm. in the 95th minute and have the game end on a controversial penalty, which, you know, inevitably it's going to, no matter which decision you make, but he can fall back on VAR is going to review it. And if it's, something that they can say is undeniable it's a penalty you know it is what it is but if they can't they can always fall back on basically the call on the field stands we don't see a clear and obvious error to overturn mm. it and i think that's where this fell but again if that foul happens same situation just outside the box at the 20 minute mark we're setting up for a set piece every time because there's no chance they're not calling it a foul but late in the game there's a human factor people don't want it decided by things like that and I, and I think that definitely plays a major role in how these get adjudicated towards the end of games. At the end of the day, and I will just keep going back to this, our performance wasn't good enough mm -hmm. to warrant my anger and obsession with this single call, right? Like, if this game was on a knife's edge and we were really, like, we saw just the highest quality between two top-level teams and it was just, like, millimeters, you would see me get more angry about this decision. But there was just too much in that game for me to, like, pin our us getting a draw just on this one thing. I'm too disappointed with our own players. And I want to make sure that we're, we're clear about something. I'm disappointed with our players and I'm disappointed by that performance. But what I'm not disappointed in is the fact that we've come this far and the incredible achievement that those young boys and that young manager have done. I, I want to make sure that we're clear. I can be both mad that we didn't win the game, that we made some bozo mistakes because that was a little bit of that bozo gene uh, you know, coming in again. But I can also be very proud of the fact that the first time back in the Champions League after I don't know how many years, we made it to the quarterfinals. And not only that, we made Bayern Munich look ordinary. 
Um, I think it says no a lot. ref can take that away from us. Yeah, it, it says a lot that we would all agree Arsenal didn't play our best game. And I think a draw is a fair result. I don't think we played well enough to deserve a win over Bayern Munich in the Champions League. But the the other side of that is we're saying we didn't play well and we just drew with a perennial powerhouse in the Champions League. So I, I think it shows that we are on that level. And I think in a vacuum, you know, if these two teams played 100 times, I think Arsenal gets much the better of that 100. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's not the luxury we have. You've got to You've got to go out and perform the one chance you get, or in this case, the two chances you get. But when we go to Munich, now the pressure's on us. You know, they they just have to defend their home ground. They've got a bit of an advantage with that. And we've got to go out and perform. But I think we're the better team, and we're still perfectly capable of it. In, in years past, I would have said we couldn't do it. Now I have a lot of confidence that we definitely have it in us to go there and get a result. Yeah, and I want to make sure that it's not just the players on the pitch, it's also the fans in the stands. Every single one of us needs to pick ourselves up, put ourselves together, and make sure you are supporting the uh, the team for the rest of this stage. They have done too much for you to not be proud. Like, if you want to win the big trophies, do you think that right now Real Madrid fans are going, it's over, we're done? It's No, they're going a la Madrid. We're going to go to the Etihad and we're going to score another goal. And Man City's fans believe the same thing about their game. So mm-hmm. you better back your team. And I don't care what you have going on your lo- in your life. Call out sick, you know, I, I, you know, find a babysitter, make peace with your partner. Maybe you need a divorce because now is not the time to make an excuse. Now's the time to watch the fucking Arsenal. OK, and it, and it's just that simple. Now, we've been talking about the, the, the Champions League. We will wrap it up here, but I do want to briefly talk about the elephant in the room, the elephant sitting on top of the Premier League. Arsenal Football Club over this last weekend managed to once again climb to the top of the tree. How are you feeling about the um, how are you feeling about the league right now, Jared? It's hard to not feel good. I mean, at this stage, we take it match week by match week. And the past match week was a great result for us. We went from second to first. So, you know, it's it's a small victory. It guarantees you nothing, obviously. Um, Liverpool and City are both capable of going on extremely good runs of win, mm-hmm. win after win after win. Now, the advantage we have is it's, it's in our hands now. If we go out and do what we're supposed to do, the league is ours. That said, that's an incredibly difficult task to go out after the run we've already been on and say you need to win another what, seven games in a row, I think. Seven or eight, I lost count. Seven, I think. So it's very difficult. But like I said, I take it match week by match week, and we're better now than we were last week. So it's it's a positive. It's been a good week for us. And uh, you know, the next one up is Villa. So they come thick and fast this time of year. There's no easy games, and and we've got to be up for it because they're a capable team, despite faltering a little bit the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and and you were talking about advantages we have. Advantages we have is William Saliba. Advantages we have is Declan Rice. Advantages we have is that we scored the most goal and we, goals and we've conceded the fewest. The advantages we have is Mikel motherfucking big balls Arteta raising the fucking standards. That's what we have going into this run-in, okay? I get it. I get what's happening. Every time you hear a fan telling saying that we must and Arsenal need this trophy and blah, 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 all that's going on is they are bitter because they see what's happening. Imagine imagine the scenes right now gooners around the world drink it in it is may we are crowned the champions the trophy is given to us at the emirates and then beyond that Mikel arteta becomes the youngest manager in history to win the premier league does it over a Manchester City team that sh- just came off of winning the treble, quite possibly could have won it again, quite possibly, you know, trying to go for a 4 P against a Jurgen Klopp, one of the best Premier League managers that the uh, league has ever seen. And in his goodbye tour, Mikel Arteta manages to beat them both. They are not ready for that storyline. That narrative will make me un- insufferable for the entire summer. I, Twitter, just close it down now because it will not end. The sh- amount of shamelessness I will be able to fit in however many characters you're allowed in a tweet is going to be wonderful. So I'm really excited. I think that we've shown an incredible amount of fight. And the last thing I want to do is I want to really just call out a player of the month because you know this podcast we podcast when we want we haven't had a chance to give everybody their flowers and i really want to give one of these players their their flowers 
Who's your player of the month, Jared? Oh man, it's a luxury to have it be a difficult decision. The guy I'm going to pick over the last month, just based on consistency and being there and effort and running, just everything all in one. I'm going to go Ben White. I, mm. I love the way he's played this whole calendar year, especially the last month. He just, if ever there's a player who will just go out there, do what's asked of him at 110% for the entire time he's on the pitch, he's just been relentless. And I think he's been one of the one of the many bright spots this whole season, but especially this month as well. Benny, quite good at the football, Blanco, uh, coming in. I, I How has he not been the best right back in the league? I don't know. I honestly, you know, at this point, I, I just, I get it. I get it. He's maybe not as flashy, but I, I don't know what he's missing. He's got the pace. He's got the defensive nows. He, he can pass a ball like no other. I just, I don't know why he doesn't get those flowers, but hey, maybe that's because he's not in the England team. I would say that mine, though, would have to go to our captain. I think that leading a team, I think that there's something to be said about not only at the level that he's playing at individually, but also the level that the team is playing at. And a lot of that comes down to him and what he does on the pitch. I've, I, you know, we give Mikel Arteta a lot of credit as we should for the revelation, the, the rebirth that is Kai Havertz. But I don't think that Kai Havertz does half what, half of what he does is if Martin Odegaard isn't there telling him exactly what to do. Whenever I watch these two on the pitch, Martin Odegaard can control the press like like a, like like he's a Jedi and he's got like a, a you know controlling it with his mind just like as he moves his hands around so do the players move around the pitch it's incredible to watch and super exciting I love it and that's why I have to give it to my player of the month would be Martin Odegaard he's uh he's something else yeah there's no question we've got a good one in the captain and we've got a lot of guys in the team that could fill a can wear the armband with confidence but we've got an absolute gem and I'm happy he's the captain and I'm happy he's going to be the captain for the foreseeable future because that's the other thing we don't really mention today is we're just talking primarily about the Champions mm -hmm. League is every player we've mentioned today probably is on the front half or into the prime of their career and is signed at Arsenal for at least three to five more years. So it should be a team that it's not just challenging for multiple trophies this year, but for the next handful of years to come. So Exciting time to be an Arsenal fan for sure. It's a dramatic uptick from what we saw the last decade, and, I, and I'm loving it. What will not last for many years to come is this episode of TGP. We will be bringing it to a close. I will not talk your ear off. We are we are trying to do these these uh, more like instead of pod feasts more like pod meals you know trying to slim down we don't need two hour long pods there are are only two of us even though i am sure especially you ladies could listen to our voices forever um i do want to go ahead and, and call it a day we have aston villa on the horizon i believe that's on saturday am i am i right i'm not even remembering now if it's saturday maybe a sunday is it saturday or sunday and we have of course the return yeah. The return trip to Munich, where where that's going to be big. I we won't be making any predictions here. Why? Because as many of you guys know, or maybe you don't, I'm an atheist, but I'm not arrogant. All right, and I am not so arrogant that I'm going to believe that the supernatural. Like, what if I'm wrong? If I'm wrong about the supernatural, I don't want Arsenal to be the um, to be the casualty of war there. So so we are going to not be predicting any sort of scores because I don't want to anger the football gods. Um, any last words before we get out of here, Jared? No, looking forward to Villa, looking forward to the next one at Bayern. And I think there's going to be a lot of exciting football yet to come this year. So look forward to doing it again with you soon. Yeah. And, and as always, it is fun. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe down below. The likes really, really help us out. And guys, it's been a long, long journey this year, an exciting journey, and one that many told us that we would never be on again, saying that last year was our only choice. But as Mikel Arteta has told us all, this is the Arsenal. We are here to stay. The Kings of London have returned. Goodbye, everybody. Join in the banter through our social media outlets. You can like us on Facebook at Gooners in USA. Follow us on Twitter at, at Gooners in USA. Send us an email at gooners at goonersinusa.com. Check out our